Issue 120. We start out on New Year's Day in Emerald Hill, as I wonder if this is a world where there's only snow around on two times of the year. New Year's and Christmas. I mean, this is a fantasy universe, so they could explain that. The civilians, who can't figure out what to make their New Year's resolution about, say that they're going to a club to make people more assertive rather than indecisive. I wonder if he'll turn out to be a villain, or at least create some conflict, since he was brought up at the start of the story as a new character. Sonic immediately snarks, sounds like a place for losers to me. Catch you later, dude. See, a hero who's like an elementary school bully. This is what Fleetway Sonic is. And I like the double meaning of the civilian replying to that with, Maybe. Because why would you want Sonic to talk to you again after he called you a loser? And yup, I immediately guessed that Wally was a bad guy because he smirked with evil-looking eyes with no eyeballs in them and told the civilians going behind a curtain, I'll do thinking for you. I wonder if he wants to brainwash them. He tells them to resolve to destroy Sonic. And some absolutely horrible writing shows up, as despite them objecting to it, they're extremely easily manipulated. With one guy saying, What's a hedgehog ever done for us? And another saying, Exactly! Despite knowing he's a hero. They could have at least mentioned that Sonic called them all losers. That would have been kind of an excuse. Uh, taking advantage of Chekhov's gun, actions having consequences. I thought he was gonna literally brainwash them, not manipulate them pathetically enough. Not manipulate them pathetically just by calling them wimps. I get that Sonic calling them losers would cause resentment, but none of them looked mad at him for that. And they don't even mention this as a motive. The civilians go after Sonic, with one of them even saying, Terribly sorry, Sonic, but we're gonna have to cause you great injury. And another saying, Nothing personal, while they're all diving for him. One of them insists that they can't back out of it because it's their New Year's resolution. Well, I already know what I think of this story. I mean, it's, I guess it's supposed to be funny, but no, it's just dumb. Sonic runs around them in a tornado, and when they still want to avoid backing down from a decision for once, he leads him on a cross-country run probably going slow so that they can keep up and get tired. And I chuckle with the biggest smile on my face at seeing a civilian saying destroy while wheezing and panting and keeping up with them. That's a funny image. They give up and reveal who made them go after Sonic. Sonic decides to go back to the village since they are probably only used to distract him, and we see the villains heading towards the village in a green tank on a sudden plot to destroy the Kintobor computer as a victory for the Robotnik fan club. After irony happens, as even the assertive hyena can't decide which weapon would be best to use in the heat of battle, Sonic destroys the tank with a super speed, and one of the civilians fortunately apologizes to him for earlier. The story ends with the morale that they wouldn't have gone after Sonic just because an authority figure told them to if they were more decisive. That's a dumb moral! There's still free will! Hive mind group think or not! The minute they were all told to destroy Sonic, the entire group reacted with shock and displeasure, so they should have just all stormed out together. In the next story, Tails visits Knuckles to wish him a happy new year in his plane. And since Knuckles says that times and dates go by unnoticed for him, which makes sense, Tails suggests to him buying a calendar, and sadly he isn't written to respond to that properly. Then a rumble is heard, and Knuckles pulls Tails away from an avalanche of falling snowballs. Then after they're safe, Tails discovers that his biplane's buried under some snow, and Knuckles digs it out of it, and they fly to Mushroom Hill Zone because it's safer. Tails then says he missed breakfast, which he got away with doing apparently. Doesn't he live with Sonic? Who raises him anyways? We never got to see where he lived, since that would require effort. Did he sneak away really early in the morning to fly up here by himself without breakfast? Why? It becomes very windy all of a sudden. Tails inexplicably tells them not to blame him, and a tornado happens, and Knuckles grabs Sail, saying that this is getting to be a habit. He grabs a cliff and climbs up, and Tails asks why the Twister disappeared and didn't cause any damage to the natural environment. Yeah, weird. I mean, if Tails summoned it, which would make sense since he wouldn't want to cause damage to the natural environment, you'd think he would have summoned stuff like this before or that it would happen again later on to convenience Eggman. And I'm sure Tails creating tornadoes would be too cool for him in this comic. Knuckles hits the ground to send Sonic out of the bushes, and he asks him what he's doing here as a text box says that he's the source of mystery. Sonic snarks, nice to see you too, buddy. It says that he's the one who caused the avalanche a tornado that could have easily killed or injured them. 
Knuckles, for some reason, says that he never saw Fleetway Sonic as a practical joker. Terrible judge of character there. One of Sonic's main personality traits is being a troll. Sonic says that he was just testing Knuckles' abilities to see if he still got what it takes. Reminding me of how Shadow had that dumb excuse for fighting Sonic in Generations. And Tails reveals apologetically that he was in on it, looking nervous. What couldn't Sonic get Tails to do? This could have killed Knuckles! Knuckles says that they've got a nerve instead of some nerve. I guess he screwed up the idiom for being isolated, but with that amount of isolation, it's probably thanks to the Master Emerald's power that he even knows English at all. So you'd think it would have time idioms too, and also you'd think they would have pointed out that he screwed up the idiom. I guess it's the correct way of speaking El Mobius, or in British English. Knuckles says he'll be there to fight Eggman when they need him. Well, that was really easy compared to Archie. And the story ends with Knuckles making a stupid pun, which is out of character for Knuckles, and Sonic admitting, I guess I deserved that. Yeah, you did. Because it could have gotten Knuckles and Tails hurt or killed, and you never even point that out directly. I was expecting to see Windy Witchcart, uh, I mean, Windy whatever her last name was. So it really says something that I was expecting a villain to be behind all this. I mean, this is a twist, but this is very out of character for Sonic. And how did his tornado not damage the natural environment? I guess he's that much of an aerokinetic, but tornadoes are kind of hard to control, and he created it by running around in a circle. Not by having complete control over it as a... Uh, Aerokinetic. As Amber's about to leave to go back to her dimension because the gateway between dimensions will trollishly decide to close on its own soon, she magically gives Shortfuse a program as a gift, which conveniently opens up his armor to set him free. Well then, I didn't think this would ever happen. They're just giving the Peace Wizards any power they want now, aren't they? I'd be more forgiving if they just flat out said Amber's people are wizards. Techno says that now Shortfuse can wear the armor by choice whenever he wants to, so he can finally stop single-mindedly bitching about being trapped in it. Amber warps away, saying that they'll only see her again if their dimensions become parallel again. So dimensions just move around in the space-time continuum and decide to become parallel to each other sometimes? Uh, on a whim? I mean, galaxies do move in the universe. I guess the dimensions move a lot faster? Techno makes a joke that Shortfuse should take a bath first before going to a party, and he doesn't immediately explain that the armor had a bathing system built into it to avoid serious hygiene issues, which would have naturally reduced the lifespan of the organic battery. Later at the party in Metropolis Zone, the mere mention of Shortfuse saying he brought his armor in case there was any badnik activity immediately gave away that there would be. Then a villain literally called the party pooper, but he'd happily call himself that I'll never know. Outright tells them that he has an evil plan, out of nowhere, saying that he thinks he'll freeze time by stopping the city clock, saying, now it'll never be 1998. Well, that's dated. Amy snarks, get real, time doesn't stand still if you stop a clock, you donut. Yeah, someone should tell that to Einstein for his light speed time slowing experiment. This is the most forced villain ever, why would he tell them he's gonna do this before doing it? Then Techno says as the bell rings that it's a brass bell, so the villain's magnet didn't even affect it. He lampshades an embarrassment that he was never very good at science. Then how did he make the magnet? Then he tries to use his weapon against the Shortfuse armor to destroy it, but Shortfuse attacks him afterwards, and the villain panics about his magnetic ray pulling scaffolding towards them. Shortfuse panics, asking what he should do without his armor around, and Amy pushes him all the way, snarking relatably, Moving out of danger might be a good start. Well, maybe he panicked and thought he wouldn't get away in time. Techno lampshades that he's the most useless villain they've ever met, so it's intentional, and is told that he only turned to crime because he's never invited to parties. After he makes the New Year's resolution to be good, it turns out his magnetic ray had reactivated a prisoner by accident, and the story ends with Vermin breaking out of a cell. That's interesting, so there's a twist where the harmless comedy relief villain has a threatening effect by accident. This is this is definitely the, the the best part of the comic, like where after Eggman gets defeated, like it becomes a lot more creative because it's not just Eggman all the time. This issue was by Luke Stringer. It was about three one-shots about New Year's, 
In the first one, it really would have been better if the people had been brainwashed into trying to destroy Sonic, like I assumed. Because groupthink and indecisiveness or not, there's no way they would have done this because one person told them to. Especially since they all objected to it immediately. So they would have just followed the crowd and took off right away. It would have required more assertiveness and willpower to stay. They could have at least mentioned that they're mad at Sonic for calling them all losers like a bully to have some sort of justification. Sonic prevents the villains from trying to destroy Kintobor with their tank, and in the next story, we have Sonic creating an avalanche and tornado that could have injured or killed Knuckles and Tails, not because he was brainwashed, but because he wanted to test Knuckles' ability. But he must have had faith in him to begin with, or he wouldn't have risked their lives like that. Remember, avalanches are supposed to be lethal. They crush you and suffocate you under all that snow. Not to mention the getting you cold part. So we just risk their lives for nothing. Which is fascinatingly sociopathic of Sonic to do, but still not clearly intentionally evil of him. And while he admits he deserved being punned at the end, that's it. There's no dialogue box or thought bubble from him about why he knows he deserves that. That's the only punishment he gets. Knuckles should have known he was a practical joker type. That's kind of who Sonic is. I just wouldn't expect him to do that to his own friends, Fleetway Sonic or not. I was expecting Windy the Weather Machine Girl to be behind all this. And in the final story, Amber magically lets Shortfuse come out of his armor whenever he wants because let's just give the peace aliens omnipotence while we're at it. She could have been called a wizard to explain that better. Even the Chaos Knuckles arc makes more sense, because at least Panders explained that Knuckles got his powerful magic because Locke bioengineered him to be that way, whereas she can just take him out of his armor for no reason. I mean, I love this change for him, and I wasn't expecting it to happen, but it wouldn't have felt like such a deus ex machina if it happened naturally instead of an alien doing it. Which is no better than the Robians all being de-roboticized in Archie because aliens did it, instead of the portable de that were clearly introduced. Also, I love the fact that there's actual twists where I'm expecting a badnik attack because of clumsy foreshadowing to it. A clearly comedy relief film with a magnet ray shows up instead, and not only is his total incompetence as a villain pointed out self-awarely, but his magnet ray has a threatening consequence by accident by letting Vermin the Sovereignik escape. While the beginning sucked, there were a lot of genuinely good twists in this issue, instead of the comic being predictable like it always is. So that's good. It's just weird of a issue to 120 to be a series of mere one-shots about New Year's being pointless, rather than being an issue where something big happens, other than Vermin escaping, as a milestone issue like I expected.